Okay, in the, in the business world, some of you are business people, right? And in the business world, it's really that corner office where the CEO sits there. The CEO, he or she is important, right? Big title, big office, CEOs are important. Churches too, because Christmas Easter only visitors, CEOs, Christmas Easter only, that's an important part of a church, you know? <laughs> If it wasn't for y'all, I think the, the, the pews just fly up to the ceiling if y'all aren't here to hold them down on these. Uh, you know, I think it's scientifically proven that on Easter, people sing louder. You saw it with the choir, but you do too, because a lot of you, you don't sing on Sunday mornings. I mean, maybe you read the New York Times and people still do that, but this is fabulous to have people come together and sing new songs and old songs and be together with holiness embedded in our day. We're thankful for all of you. you there's a lot of churches out there, and you choose to be with this community of grace, this family of faith on this special day. So welcome to all of you. Now, for those of you who've been here for several weeks, several years, several decades, some of you were like that. Um, if you've been here for a while, you know that we are in a series during the season of Lent, a worship series called A Worthy Zoo. And this is the final installment where we're kind of taking stories from the Bible that have something to do with animals and we're seeing God's message through that. And so we get to the Lamb of God, God, that, so the kids who are drawing, there's the word God, um, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Um, the Lamb is a gentle side of a wild God. A lamb is supposed to, in this, in this prophecy of sorts, take away the brokenness, and not just yours, not just mine. Each, we have plenty of brokenness. If you added up all the hurt in this room, oh, it's, it's devastating, but the whole world's hurt is a lot. The whole world's hopes that get unfulfilled is a lot. And the, the gentleness of creation itself, this is the claim, this is the claim of this Easter, that the gentleness of creation takes away everything that does not live up to the promise of love. That's the claim. Now, if you're not coloring and looking for the words God and love, think for a bit for the most important words in the sentence that Pat read. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Of course, there's the, the, the two words that are coloring there. Sin is such a loaded word. Some of you come from churches and traditions and childhood where the word sin was just like a, like a threat and a danger. And it just, it, three little letters carried so much weight and it, so much baggage and turned, it, it feels like that sometimes to me. That's, we don't have to load, we don't have to land on that one. But I want to spend some time with one of the little words in that sentence, away, away. And I want you to think of it with me like this. This, this is Easter. There's a lot of candy out there. We just promised a lot of kids are going to get a lot of candy. Now, if I want to, I'm a lot bigger than all those kids. I can take away all their candy. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty tough. I mean, I'm weaker than I used to be, but I could take away some kids' candy if I wanted to enact my power, right? But we said this is a God of gentleness. So I don't think Easter is about power, not that kind of a way. So maybe a little better. Taking away could mean removing some burden from you. The choir just sang the last words of the choir was the chains fall off. And while I don't know any chains in the Easter story exactly, it's a, it's a beautiful metaphor of the, the chains that we hold on us and the things that we drag behind us in life that are so worrisome and wearisome. So that's a, that's a good bird, and, and it, could, it could be good news. In fact, uh, it, it's better news than stealing candy from a, a baby, but there's a lot of churches today that the Easter message is Jesus can take away your sin, and they mean a lot by that, if you believe fill in the blank. And you get to fill in the blank with some, some pretty things and some silly things and some weird things and some hurtful things, and... Maybe that's better, but it, to me it makes God sound more like a salesman than a source of peace. And I don't want to worship a salesman. If you were a salesman, that's fine, but I'm not going to worship you. <laughs> it would be better news, another step forward to me. If someone told me that somehow Jesus does take away our burdens, if, if you told me that despite whatever my experience in my life, that there is this 
fount of peace that takes away guilt and grief and despair and doubt. Period. No if. Ooh, that's, that's, I tell you what, there's a lot of churches. That's called a good liberal Easter message right there. And there's a lot of churches that get to that space right there. They say new life is coming to you. We didn't say he has risen 2,000 years ago. We said he is risen. And the he is a little bit iffy because it's Christ that rises, but that's a sermon for a different year. Resurrection and hope and the light of the world is here, no matter what you've done, no matter what you believe, no matter how you behave. And I have preached that sermon a lot in my life. Some of us in this room have preached that sermon on Easter. It's good. It's maybe better. But today I want something better than better. Today I want to engage with the best news of Easter. I want to, I want to imagine the power that Mary felt at the tomb. Just, just the... the what did the men say? This is nonsense. That's the word the Bible used. When Mary came and said, I, you gotta, I, can you not going to believe this? And they say, we don't. We don't believe it. It's nonsense. The times in your life when a glimmer of hope has felt like nonsense to you, that's power. That's overwhelming. I, I want to find the mysticism that John felt at the river. The John that in the beginning of the book, this is different Johns, but it's complicated. Lots of Marys, lots of Johns. The John who said, I see something in that guy. I see a, some, something that's different about the world. Not just that one person, but I see a path for healing and wholeness and love for so many of us. So that word away, what would the geometry of sacred life be like if all this guilt and shame and the grossness of life, the burdens, the chains, what if it wasn't just away from you, but really away, just away, just gone, away from all of us, away from significance? What if this celebration is about all the sadness and brokenness and loneliness and despair of the world what if the point is that it's not about you and the lamb, but the lamb just takes all that and throws it in the trash can, in the spiritual trash can. It's gone. What if, what if the lamb, the gentle embodiment of Jesus, is some key? Take all the racism, take all the sexism, take all the homophobia, take all the transphobia, take all the environmental degradation, take all the misogyny, take it all, and put it on the side of the curb on the day that they take it away really a way, where you never have to see it? What, what if Easter is about all the anxiety and the shame and, and the I'm not good enough and I'll never be good enough and all those feelings and the whole culture that props that up with all of its advertising and all of its marketing and all of its messages that you're not good enough and you just watch that roll down the street away from all the houses toward that spiritual dump because that's where it belongs, the spiritual dump. Easter says that all that stuff that has weighed you down, all the stuff that has clogged up your life, all the things that sometimes it feels like it's killing you, Easter says in a gentle and sincere way, that stuff doesn't belong here anymore. That stuff doesn't belong here because you are meant to bloom something so much better. And that's the key. Taking away something heavy means giving space for something light. Taking away something burdensome means giving room for you to grow. Easter says that when all that brokenness is far enough away, imagine the room you have in your heart for something more. Imagine the life you could live without those burdens. Imagine the world that we could create together without all the barriers to well-being. I can do better than that. Imagine the world that God would want to create, not just us. We have lots of different ideas. But imagine that amazing world of freedom and peace and hope and beauty and wonder. Imagine it, what it would be like for the Spirit of God to meet us in our tombs and to walk out in the direction of wholeness. And imagine that every time we step off in the wrong direction and get lost, as we will always do, the Spirit guides us back. Every time, every day, you have that missed opportunity to live your fullest self with a hopeful smile, the Spirit welcomes you back without judgment and with forgiveness. So we try again. How would God resurrect this world 
and take all the hate and all the self-hate and just get rid of it. Imagine what it would be like for God to meet us at any emptiness of joy and remind us to witness the light surrounding, to seize hold of second chances and third, and to see meaning that comes from chaos. So for all the stress you may feel, for all the mistakes that will happen the second you walk out that door, for all the disappointments that are sure to come on Monday and Tuesday, you have a gentle, wild, wonderful life stretching ahead of you, and you are promised a future of hope connected to the Spirit and grounded by love. May it be so.